Well, thank you very much for that warm welcome. And I also really want to extend my appreciation to the history department uh, for inviting me here. This looks, is a wonderful place to give a lecture. As you can tell from the title, I'm not going to be able to tell you everything that's in my book. <laughs> it covers a lot. So what I'm going to try to do tonight is give you a series of snapshots, uh, what I see as important threads and themes for understanding a concept that all of us know, people still use, uh, but we often don't know where it really comes from and why it's so prevalent. Uh, and the big point that I want to point out is that we have to understand that in America, we do have a class system. We've always had a class system. And we often don't connect it to British understandings of rural society. And that's actually where white trash comes from. I'd like to begin tonight with a film that we all know, To Kill a Mockingbird. The plot centers on a moralistic lawyer, Atticus Finch, who refuses to perpetuate the racial double standard. He agrees to defend an African-American, Tom Robinson, on the charge of raping a poor white girl, Mayella Yule. The court finds Robinson guilty but everyone knows he is innocent. An honorable, hard-working family man, Robinson stands well above the degraded Yules, his poor white accusers. The shabbily attired Mayella is cowled by her bully of a father, a scrawny man in overalls, devoid of either merit or morality. He's Bob Yule. His full name is Robert E. Lee Yule. And as you can guess, he's not an heir of one of the aristocratic families of the Old South. As Harper Lee describes them in the novel of which the classic film was based, the Yules were members of the terminally poor, those whose status could not be altered, up or down, by any economic shift, not even the depression in which the story is set. The Yules live behind the town dump, which they comb through regularly. They had congenital defects and hookworm. Their shack looked like, and this is how Harper Lee described it, a playhouse of an insane child. No one knew how many children lived there. Some thought nine, others six. To the town of Maycomb, Alabama, the Ewell children were simply dirty-faced ones at the window when anyone passed. Southerners and others, too, called such people white trash. The Yules are not bit players in our country's history. And their history opens in the 1500s, not the 1900s. It starts with British colonial policies dedicated to resettling the poor, decisions that left a permanent imprint on America and on the structure of classes. First known as waste people, and later white trash, Marginalized Americans were stigmatized for their inability to be productive, their failure to own property, their unhealthy children, their lack of any sense of uplift on which the American dream is predicated. It's contrary to the national credo, but the truth is that Americans are quite comfortable rationalizing economic inequality. They have naturalized poverty, determining that it's something beyond human control. By this measure, poor whites were classified as a distinct breed. And I'm going to return to that theme over and over again, the importance of breeding. In other words, breeding was not just about the cultivation of social manners or skills. That's merely one definition. It was also about something more sinister, an imposed inheritance. The language of class that early Americans embraced was a composite of English attitudes toward vagrancy, as well as a transatlantic fixation on animal husbandry, demography, and pedigree. Yes, the poor were at once described as waste and inferior animal stocks in the colonial imagination. 
We'd prefer to believe all that has changed, but well into the 20th century, sterilization of the breeding poor struck many, even professionals, as a rational solution to an old problem. So let's not displace colonial history too easily. For centuries, the worst classes were regarded as extrusions of the least inhabitable, inhabitable land, scrubby, barren, swampy wasteland. And all that still relates to home ownership and the rich and poor neighborhoods of today. The poor have been with us, the white poor have been with us in various guises, as the names given across the centuries attest. And this isn't even all of the names that have been used at different historical time periods to describe poor whites. The first one, as I mentioned, is waste people, rascals. Did you know the word rascal actually comes from the meaning trash? Rubbish, off-scourings, lubbers, hillbillies, low-downers, trailer trash. What I've also discovered in writing this book is that even though, as I'm going to talk about this, we like to imagine these people as marginalized and visible, in fact, they've often been pushed front and center in America's most formative events. From Western expansion to the Civil War and Reconstruction and FDR's New, New Deal and LBJ's Great Society. Now, throughout time, they've been blamed for many things. They've been blamed for living on bad land, as though they had other choices. They've been called slothful, rootless vagrants, and it's assumed that they're physically scarred just as their surroundings were. The worst ate clay and turned yellow, wallowed in the muck, and their necks were burnt, reddened by the hot sun. Their ill-clothed, meanly fed children sentenced future generations to permanent defectiveness. Now, all these themes, I'm going to explain where they come from and how they're used in different time periods. And we may think that these themes don't exist anymore. But in fact, today's trailer trash are seen as yesterday's vagrants on wheels, an updated version of Okies and Jalopies and Florida crackers in their rude carts. Now, while America likes to think that the American Revolution enabled us to break free from aristocracy and inherited class stations, the truth is different. English ideas about class and poverty never really disappeared. Think of this for a point of comparison. Jefferson's yeoman democracy fantasized a fertile country supporting hardy, independent farm families. Yet what happens when the yeoman fails? And what about those who never achieve economic independence? Now, as I said, it begins in the 1500s. It was Richard Hacklick, the Elizabethan promoter of colonization, who first employed the term waste people to describe the expendables that could be literally dumped in the New World. In his 1584 Discourse of Western Planting, he hoped to persuade the queen of the merits of colonization. Hacklick called America not terra firma, firma, but a waste firm. The American landscape, though he'd never seen it, was described as an unproductive terrain that could only be improved by turning the waste firm into one giant workhouse filled with all the idle dregs drawn from English society. Ex-soldiers, orphans, children of, the wandering, of wandering beggars, criminals, debtors, vagrants. And if they were lucky enough to survive, these idols might be recycled and sent off to fight in English wars. Now, the group that the British and the English hated the most were vagrants. They were idle folk, analogized to weeds stifling healthy growth in a garden. They wandered the countryside, detached from the economy, much like the wasteland left fallow and untilled. So they were rounded up, some were branded, put into workhouses. Children were actually taken off the streets 
and sold as indentured servants to cruel masters in America. They were also notably referred to as the off-scourings. And I'm going to use that term again. Uh, it's a rather unpleasant term, which refers to fecal waste. And so does the quote that I have there. Now, this notion of waste in all its various manifestations persisted. Abigail Adams dismissed the poor and landless as rubbish. So did Thomas Jefferson, who proposed that a few promising impoverished white boys might be, quote, raked from the rubbish and given an education. But his bill, drafted in 1779, failed in the Virginia legislature. The ruling elite had little desire to raise up even a few wastrels. As for the language of human stocks, it wasn't eat, pray, love, but it was eat, graze, and breed, whether on two or four legs. Political arithmetic, pre-Darwin, proposed a means to calculate human productivity. Benjamin Franklin was an early proponent who compared human patterns of migration and fertility to that of ants and pigeons. The unsettled frontier land was a lure to families, he argued, like ants to a honeypot. Overcrowding in pigeon boxes in the experiment that he did meant that the weak would have to move on. Franklin's demographic argument constituted an early form of survival of the fittest. Those who bred large families and toiled long were rewarded, while the idle would have to either keep moving or die off. And as you can guess, Franklin had no sympathy for the poor whatsoever, even though he did not come from an elite family. Breeding was at the heart of the domestic slave trade, and Jefferson coldly admitted that female slaves were a good investment. To his mind, free white women were breeders too. In a series of letters that he exchanged with John Adams in 1813, he argued that humans were animals guided by the overriding impulse of sexual desire. Lust, however, if it was tempered by reason among the most gifted, he argued, was producing what he called a fortuitous concourse of breeders. This model of breeding generated for Jefferson an accidental aristocracy of talent. Class division arose through natural selection. Superior men were supposed to marry for more than money. They would consciously and unconsciously choose mates with favorable traits. It was all a matter of probability. Now the question neither Jefferson or his calculating colleagues never answered was this. What happened to those outside the talented, rational elite? What future awaited the concourse of breeders living on the bottom layer of society? No matter how one fin finessed it, rubbish produced more rubbish. Now, Jefferson, like Franklin, hoped the poor would be drawn into the Western territories. So this is why our Western territories were like the colonies for the British. They were to drain away the poor and the waste. What also became prevalent in Jefferson's theory and proved to be long-lasting in justifying why the United States was truly a promised land was the idea that horizontal mobility would substitute for upward mobility. That means moving across the land was the alternative to actually moving up the social ladder. And this theory is important because it laid the foundation for America's myth of a classless, exceptional society. But if we think about that logically, and if we think about that as historians, this theory was flawed from the get-go. The West was never an open space. Land speculators and powerful men always had the advantage in purchasing the best land. Western land wasn't free, and the poor rarely had the funds to buy the parcels sold by the federal government. Instead, they invaded public lands as trespassers, and the government often had to physically remove them. They became the dominant class of the early Republican antebellum period, 
that you've never heard of. America's version of English vagrants, squatters, and crackers. Now, the legendary Davy Crockett, believe it or not, was a outspoken advocate of squatters' rights. That's the real Crockett, not the legend. The legend, as you see here, taken from his, the, a popular sort of comic, exaggerated version of Crockett and the stories he told, portrayed him as a corn cracker, which is a variation, it's the Kentucky variation of cracker. Now what's funny about Crockett is that he also claimed, the legendary version, and this, based on the stories that he told, claimed that one of the many excellent powers that he had, what is he had the ability to squat down lower than any man. Now that may sound strange. We can understand him claiming to be Superman and jump as high as he possibly could, and he claimed that he could do all these magical things, but this illusion is particularly important because he's referring to his own squatter past. And as we know, the idea of being a squatter is not simply, simply something to celebrate. The words squat and squatting carried more than one dis uh, disreputable meaning. The term suggested spilling out across the land, and it also had other more unpleasant allusions to waste, but it also had a significant legal meaning. In the British law, which we inherited, squatting was the opposite of standing, to have legal standing. And legal standing also was part of the legal principle, the English legal principle, that justified claims to sovereignty and also justifies the right to the land, to have standing. The word right itself comes from the root that means to stand erect. So it's important that we visualize what these words mean. Now, the cracker, that's a term you've probably all heard of. What's interesting is cracker gets associated with the southern backcountry. And quite early, in the 1760, a British officer in the Carolinas described crackers as idle stragglers, vagabonds worse than Indians, who were constantly changing their place of abode. The word cracker migrated all the way from Virginia to Florida, along with the roving, migrating rural poor. Now, why the name cracker? What does that really mean? Where does that come from? Well, they were called cracking traders before the revolution because they were described as noisy braggarts, prone to lying and vulgarity. In English, one could crack a jest. Crude Englishmen cracked wind. Firecrackers gave off a stench and were loud and disrupted. Louse cracker referred to a lice-ridden, slovenly fellow. And another significant connection was the adjective crack-brained which was the English slang for idle-headed. Again, reminding us that the poor are always idle. And this is a kind of recurrent obsession for the English and for American colonists. Squatters and crackers weren't yeomen, they weren't peasants, they weren't tenants. Cracker women were looked at as barely being women at all. They were mocked as haggard, lean, dirty, ugly, and toothless. Hoosaroons, a variation on mixed waste quadrones, was a word coined to describe Indiana squatters' dozen of dirty yellow urchins. And that word, hooser, no linguistic knows where it comes from. They have no idea. They can't figure it out. They may have been hunters and crude farmers, but the main attribute of squatters and crackers, which they both shared, was their constant movement. There even was a cracker dictionary that was published in the 1830s that began to identify and collect and identify their distinctive patois. And that's interesting because in the 30s, it's the same time the English start to study Cockney. So this is kind of the American version of Cockney. And it included the verb obsquatulate, which is a word I love. And try to use it whenever you can in the future, because it's got squat right in it. It's like such a great word. 
which meant the definition was to mosey or to abscond. Both options are possible. That meant they were either on the slow road to nowhere or on the run, like an absconding servant. Now, what's interesting about squatters is they were the majority of the population in Kentucky in the 1790s. And they remained 35 to 40 percent of the population in Tennessee, Alabama, and elsewhere in the Southwest as late as the 1850s. And that's important because these people are prevalent. They're everywhere. And they become, in certain places later in California, a political force. But this also points to the fact that the whole safety valve theory didn't really work. In the Old South, for example, as one scholar has carefully studied the numbers, the, the, the number of landless poor whites grew at astonishing rates, even without migration. So it's not surprising that by the 1840s, there's a dramatic shift away from talking about squatters and crackers. And that could be in the Old Northwest, that could be in the back country in the Southwest. And they begin to focus on what is now known as white trash. And white trash begins to be specifically identified as a southern phenomenon. And on top of that, they begin to describe them as, quote, a curious species of southerners, noted for their yellow parchment skin color, their children's shocking white hair resembling that of an albino. To top it off, clay-eating poor whites were condemned for their sickly and abnormal children, described as shrunken and wrinkled, looking like old, loathsome, cadaverous dwarfs. The tallow-faced gentry, as one Kansas newspaper mockingly labeled them, routinely stuffed their inf infants' mouths with clay. So by the 1840s, white trash have now become clinical specimens belonging to an inferior breed. Now, like breeds like, a saying that was taken directly from animal husbandry served as the guiding principle for these damning portraits. The wealthy South Carolinian Mary Chestnut described a local woman she knew as a perfect specimen of the Sandhill tacky race. Now tacky, again, another word maybe you haven't heard of, tacky was a degenerate breed of horse that lived in the Carolina marshlands. Chestnut went on to describe that she looked the part, and here you have her colorful language. Her skin was yellow and leathery. Even the whites of her eyes were bilious in color. She was stumpy, strong, and lean, hard-featured, horny-fisted. Alabama Daniel Hundley published a fairly important book on Southern society in 1860, all about class. And he divided the white classes into a descending order of bloodlines. He had the cavalier gentry at the top, Anglo-Saxons filling the middle and yeoman classes, and those he called southern bullies and white trash sat at the bottom. These lowest trace their lineage, and this is what he argued, trace their lineage to convicts and indentured servants of Jamestown. They were the befouled heirs of poor vagrants, the rubbish from the back alleys of old London. The vagrant stain was now congenital in the blood. Now, it's not surprising, given as we've seen that the question of white trash is becoming more prominent, it also is moving to the center of politics. And it plays a rather significant role at the center of the sectional crisis. When we look at the Civil War and the debates leading up to it and during the Civil War, what we find is that Lincoln's Republican Party insisted that slavery should not be allowed to spread west because it threatened free labor among the poor, poor white men. Now, future Confederates responded with a strident defense of their slave and class system. Like James Henry Hammond of South Carolina, more and more of the Southern elite held that class subordination was natural and that Jefferson's, this is what he wrote, Jefferson's all men are created equal was, as Hammond insisted, 
a ridiculously absurd concept. Now, Hammond was South Carolina's leading pro-slavery intellectual. He also coined the term mudsill. And mudsill is an interesting term because it served all the purposes to both attack the North, to defend slavery, as well as hold up the class hierarchy in the South. It was mudsill democracy that the Confederacy described as it made its case against the North. In 1861, Southerners mocked the Mudsill Union Army as a foul collection of urban roughs, prairie dirt farmers, greasy mechanics, and unwashed immigrants. President Jefferson Davis called the Union Army in one of his major speeches, our favorite word again, the offscourings of the earth. Now this Mudsill term came from Hammond's 1858 speech. And he was arguing that what was essential to the southern structure of society was the fixed nature of class identity. In all societies, he said, there must be a class to do the menial duties, to perform the drudgery of life. And he insisted that those with fewer skills, lower order of intellect, they should form the base of every civilized nation. Every advanced society had to exploit its petty laborers. The working poor that wallowed in the mud allowed for a superior class to emerge on top. And the one that emerged on top was the true society that embodied all civilization, progress, and refinement. In Hammond's mind, menial laborers were almost literally mud cells, stuck in the mud, or perhaps a metaphor quicksand. If all societies had their mud cells, Hammond argued, the South had made the right choice in keeping black slaves in the lowest station. And he defended this on racial terms. He went on to argue, and this is just as important in his case, he argued that the white mud sills of the North, that the North, he, went to, he argued that the, the North had, had debased their own kind. And he said that the white mud sills of the North were, quote, of your own race. You are brothers of one blood. From Hammond's perspective, the North's flawed labor system had corrupted democratic politics. Discontented whites had been given the vote, and being the majority, it was only a matter of time before these poor Northern mud sills orchestrated a class revolution, destroying what was left of the Union. And as you can guess, the Confederate elites were equally afraid of their own white trash, that they might be tempted by the democratic processes, process, promises, and join the revolt. Now, what's interesting about the Civil War, it's not surprising that from the Union's perspective, and from re the perspective of Republican politicians, that they would want to exploit the class divisions between the planter elite and poor whites. In General Grant's estimation, the war was fought to liberate not only slaves, but non-slaveholders. Those families exiled to poor land, who had few opportunities to better themselves. They, too, needed emancipation, he insisted. And he used the precise term, poor white trash, when he described their pre-war subservience to the planter aristocracy. It's also not surprising that Abraham Lincoln would be crowned the president of the Mudsills. His humble Kentucky birthplace made him white trash in the eyes of many Southerners, and his chosen residence in Illinois made him a prairie mudsill. But what's so interesting, and this is sort of about the power of language, Union soldiers turn the invective on its head, deciding to wear the mudsill label as a badge of pride, and made it a rallying cry for Northern-style democracy. Now, what's happened by the Civil War, and continues in Reconstruction, is that the way white trash is being used has been highly politicized. It is not only talking about a distinct group of people, but it is also defending two different economic systems as they are being contrasted, the North and the South. It's also not surprising that this battle over classes would also reemerge in the 1890s. And this time, we would begin to see the term redneck. This is the first time that we see redneck become a more popular concept. 
and it's closely identified with the new Democratic demagogues of the South. South Carolina's Ben Tillman, Arkansas's Jeff Davis, and Mississippi's James Vardaman. Now, in the 1890s, using the same old theory that's associated with white trash, it was assumed that rednecks were associated with the swamps. Rednecks could also be found in the mill towns. And the descriptions sound a lot like Bob Yule. They were described, he was described as the man in overalls, a heckler at Plato Regales, and was periodically even elevated to the state legislature. One guy wrencher, a Vardaman ally, claimed the name for himself, railing on the floor of the Mississippi House about his long red neck. Now, Vardaman, if you think Trump is wild, Vardaman outdid him in light years. Vardaman, democracy, no matter how dirty, belonged to the people. And the people had the right to say whatever they felt. There was no limits. Friends and foes alike called him the white chief, partly for his white garb. But the main reason was for his role, as one critic called him, as being a medicine man, a witch doctor, literally, who knew how to inflame his low-down tribe of white savages. Now, Vardaman was the consummate showman. He rode to his Senate victory in 1912, quite literally on the back of an ox. Vardaman did all he could to drum up class resentments. And his people kind of drove the previous southern elite, made them you know, be quite fearful of the power that he represented, and basically dismissed them as people who mistake cunning for intelligence, people who go to revivals and fights and then fornicate in the bush, bushes afterwards, and this is his line up there. They were undiluted Anglo-Saxons. And that's actually a really important concept to think about. There's, he's, again, and this is a consistent theme, it's as if they're an uninvolved people that have been trapped in, in a, a time, a way of behavior, and haven't changed. Uh, but it's also important to see how he's connecting that with Anglo-Saxons. He also was afraid of them because he saw them as the sovereign voter. Um, and this is why Vardaman was powerful and threatening. Vardaman also went after the sitting president at the time, who was Harvard-educated President Theodore Roosevelt. And he actually attacked Roosevelt for his breeding. He back went and said that Roosevelt had a bit of the pup in him. And he argued this based on medieval medical theory, that his mother, Roosevelt's mother, had seen a dog while she was, uh, you know, why uh, Theodore was inside of her, was in her womb, and somehow part of that pup influenced him. Now, Vardaman, when he was challenged and said, this is obnoxious, you should apologize, well, of course, he said, I'll apologize to the dog, but not to Roosevelt. So this should give you a sense of the flavor of the times. Now, what we have to remember is that Roosevelt himself also bought into certain racial theories and theories about breeding. He believed that racial traits were carried in the blood and conditioned by the experience of one's ancestors. Roosevelt argued that it was the 19th century frontier experience that transformed white Americans into a superior stock. Except that is white Southerners who had taken the wrong turn on the evolutionary ladder, using bombast to conceal unhealthy traits. In a letter to Owen Wister, who was author of the heroic novel The Virginian, Roosevelt concluded that Confederates and their heirs had contributed very, very little toward anything of which Americans are now proud. For him, the Vardamans might be a nuisance, but their days in evolutionary terms were numbered. Now, the reason that Roosevelt could be so confident is that he was unabashedly a eugenicist. He used the bully pulpit in his office as early as 1903 to insist that women have a critical civic duty to breed a generation of healthy and disciplined children. Worried about race suicide, as he put it, he recommended that women of Anglo-American stock 
have four to six children, enough so the race shall increase and not decrease. In 1913, he wrote supportively to the leading eugenicist of the day, Charles Davenport, that it was the patriotic duty of every good citizen of superior stock to leave his or her blood behind. Degenerates, he warned, must not be permitted to, rep to reproduce their kind. Now, often today, when we think about the eugenics movement, we think it's just a minority of people. Well, in fact, everyone bought into eugenics. In, by the 1920s, it was called the eugenic mania, and it swept the nation. Eugenic courses were offered, were added to college curricula. Fitter family contests at state fairs gave out medals to winners like well-bred prize bulls. Defectives and the unfit were sterilized. By 1931, 27 states had sterilization laws on the books. Now, the major target of eugenesis was the poor white woman. Davenport felt that the best policy was to quarantine dangerous women, like cattle, during their fertile years. How this policy prescription led to sterilization is rather more calculated. Interested politicians and eager reformers concluded that it was cheaper to operate on women than to house them in asylums for decades. Southern eugenicists, in particular, argued that sterilization helped the economy by sending women back into the population safely neutered, but still able to work at menial jobs. Now, that should perk up your ears a little bit. One of the leading advocates of this was Albert Priddy, who called poor white Virginians the shiftless, ignorant, and worthless class of antisocial whites of the South. And he was the superintendent of the colony for epileptic, epileptics and feeble-minded in Lynchburg, Virginia. He's important because he helped shape the legal test case for sterilization, a case that went to the Supreme Court in Buck v. Bell in 1927. Carrie Buck, who's over here on this side, had been chosen for sterilization on the order of pretty because she was one of that worthless class of Southern whites. She was, in a word, his perfect specimen of white trash. While Carrie Buck was the plaintiff, her mother and daughter were on trial too. Carrie tested at the, quote, moron level, and her mother slightly lower, according to the highly biased experts. Her illegitimate child, examined at seven months, was termed feeble-minded. Now, how did they draw these conclusions? Well, what they really relied on, the experts relied on what were pedigree charts, just like breeding charts for animals. This was kind of the major tool of eugenesis. And they claim that their pedigree chart proved both degeneracy and sexual deviance. Carrie's mother had been a prostitute, and Carrie had been raped by the nephew of her adoptive parents. Her rapist went unpublished, unpunished, and yet she was sterilized. Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes offered a revolutionary decision in Buck v. Bell, which gave the state the power to regulate the breeding of its citizens. He believed that pedigree could be used to distinguish worthy citizens from waste people. Three generations of imbeciles was enough, he insisted. Sterilization was a civic duty, saving the nation from being, quote, swamped with incompetence. And notice he used the word swamped. He also echoed exactly what the English had argued in the 1600s, that the unfit would either starve or be executed for some crime. So sending them to be sterilized was as humane as being sent to the colonies was centuries before. Now, it was not until after World War II that the United States finally had a stable and large middle class. And politicians began to sing the praises that capitalism was the source of a classless society. Yet amid the rapid rise of home ownership 
home ownership of the suburb and suburbs in the 1950s and 1960s, the latest incarnation of the American dream, a controversial housing option emerged, the trailer park. As the civil rights movement grew, segregation was more than strictly a racial issue. Zoning laws made it inevitable that housing would adhere to a class-delineated geography. Now, the trailer is a conflicted American cultural symbol. It can represent untethered freedom or a tin can, a small, cheap, confined way of life. At its worst, the trailer park is associated with liberty's dark side, a deviant, dystopian wasteland on the fringes of the metropolis. Trailer trash was first identified in the southern war camps of Mississippi and Alabama in World War II. And one of those war camps was right here in Mobile. The term circulated nationally in the 1950s as similar enclaves formed around the country. In far off Arizona, as this photograph shows, trailer trash suddenly became equated with squatters. They were found in weedy errors and some with outhouses right in the front yard. In the late 50s, more mobile homes were built than prefabricated homes. Yet municipalities continued to look down on them. In 1962, in an important New Jersey court case, the majority ruled that a rural township could prohibit trailer parks within its limits. Quote, trailer dwellers had become a recognized class, one subject to discrimination. Owners of mobile homes were now classified under the law as, quote, footloose, a, a footloose nomadic people, migratory paupers. They were vagrants once more. By 1968, only 13% of mobile home owners held white collar jobs. A sizable percentage of those who lived in the poor trailer parks came from rural, mainly southern areas. Families that could not afford to buy a new trailer were buying or renting depreciated, that is, secondhand, thirdhand trailers. A new used market for trailers had emerged, what two sociologists called hillbilly havens that cropped up on the periphery of cities in the Sun Belt, the Midwest, and elsewhere, scattered along highways, often near railroad tracks, run-down trailer parks were barely distinguishable from junkyards. Trailer trash had become America's untouchables. Now, despite the automatic assumption, class has never been simply about income or financial worth alone. It has been fashioned in bodily terms. Dirty feet and tallow faces remain signs of delinquency and depravity. To live in a shack, a hovel, a shebang, or in shed town, or in a trailer park, is to live in a place that never acquires the name of home. As transitional spaces, unsettled spaces, they contain occupants who lack the civic markers of stability, predict productivity, economic value, and human worth. And our devalued urban spaces are, have become modern-day wastelands. We also really have never had a democracy in this country. I'm sure that's not shocking to everyone here. But what's interesting is that it was an Australian observer in 1949 who noted that Americans tolerate huge disparities in wealth, but they require of their political figures to use democratic statecraft. And what that means, what they want from their democratic leaders is to give them high-sounding rhetoric, and they also want their political leaders to dress down, to pretend to be one of them. And you may not have thought that this is something, this isn't just a new phenomenon, but it's actually a, no, an, of a much older phenomenon. Today, we have politicians who dress down to go to barbecues, head out, head out to hunt game. They are seen wearing blue jeans. This is something that Jimmy Carter was known for, was wearing blue jeans, camouflage, cowboy hats, bubba caps, all in an effort to come across as ordinary people. But presidents and other national politicians are anything but ordinary people after they are elected. Disguising that fact is the real camouflage that distorts the actual class nature of state power. 
But real white trash Bubba's raise different fears. In his run for the office, run for the office of the presidency, William Jefferson Clinton's enemies were ruthless in painting him as white trash, unworthy of the highest office. He was considered a pauper compared to the Republican's beloved prince, Ronald Reagan. He embodied certain stereotypes, his cholesterol-rich dining habits, and a grinning, still campaigning Clinton was photographed with a mule named George. Arkansas was ranked 47th in per capita income in 1992, and its legacy as a state scarred by redneck benightedness lingered on. Clinton, I know you young people probably don't remember any of this, Clinton actually drew on the ghost of Elvis, and Elvis was a Mississippi sharecropper son able to shed a lot of the toxic meaning of white trash and be considered cool. So Clinton drew on Elvis to help get elected by swinging his way into office by playing the Heartbreak Hotel on his saxophone for the Arsenio Hall show. And he invoked all during the campaign, kept invoking uh, Elvis all over again. And actually, uh, that was the Secret Service. what? Yes, yes, and it, and it made, um, you know, it, it made the Republicans furious uh, throughout the whole thing. Now, the attacks on Clinton considered, continued after his inauguration. In 1994, journalist Bill Maxwell of Florida, an African American, said he thought he knew why. It was Clinton's earthiness, his southerness, was seen as being bred into him by his mother, Virginia. She had published a memoir, and her story was grim. Her mother was a drug addict, her childhood was one of deprivation, she had been beaten by one husband, and she was married four times. Her appearance borrowed from trailer trash, and this is how uh, Maxwell described her. She had a skunk stripe in her hair, elaborate makeup, colorful outfits, and a racing form in hand. In the eyes of his enemies, said Maxwell, Clinton was his mother's son a kind of bastard breed that fell short of representing, quote, the right pedigree for a U.S. president. Not surprisingly, the Monica, La Monica Lewinsky impeachment scandal fit this profile of reducing Clinton's life to a pulp fiction story about trailer trash. Special Prosecutor Ken Starr's famous report mentioned sex 500 times. High crimes and misdemeanors was equated with lower class lewdness. Now today, of course, we have reality TV, an industry in white trash voyeurism, relying as well on the vaudeville tradition. A commentator remarked on the popular Duck Dynasty set in Louisiana. All the men looked like they stepped out of a Hatfield McCoy conflict to smoke a corn cob pipe. And exactly that's where they got their look from. Giving up their polo sh shirts and their golf clubs, the Robertson men were kissing cousins of the comic Ritz brothers in the 1938 Hollywood film Kentucky Moonshine. Now we today are no less consumed with pedigree than any time before. Computer dating finds class-specific partners Ivy Leaguers register at goodgenes.com to find appropriate matches. The very inventor of computer dating in 1956 got his start as a leading authority on eugenics. And nothing, as sociologists tell us, is a better predictor of a person's success in 2015 than your class background. Now, Duck Dynasty may be a cheap, an only slightly less scripted remake of the Beverly Hillbillies, but its attempt at humor masks the anxiety viewers have on their, over their own dubious pedigree. It also gives the false message that redneck roots are no longer a barrier to advancement, when in fact the class divide only grows wider. White, my point of well, what, I'm, what I'm trying to point out here is that white trash is a central, if disturbing, thread in our national narrative. The very existence of such people, both in their visibility and attempts to mask them and make them invisible, is proof that American society obsesses over the mutable layer labels we give to neighbors we wish not to notice. They are not who we are, but they are who we are. 
and have been a fundamental part of our history, whether we like it or not. Thank you.